This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. All right, page 61, Auditors and Internal Controls. The functional importance of internal audit, an independent activity, an independent appraisal activity, established within an organisation as a service to it. It's established by whom? Who establishes this internal audit activity? Yeah, all right, I was, I was going to generalise it. That's a little bit more specific than I was thinking. I was going to say management. It's management's duty to safeguard asset. It's management's duty to protect against and detect fraud and error. It's their duty to um, run the business in an orderly and efficient manner. And the ways in which they do it is they, w they will appoint or create or establish uh, an internal audit function and it will assist then in management discharging their responsibilities of running the business properly. Uh, so yes, okay, management, um, but if we are a public company, if we're a substantial company and we do have uh, non-executive directors, quite clearly we really should have an audit committee and the audit committee won't themselves establish the internal audit function but they will be reported to by the internal auditors. How often should the internal auditor meet with the chair of the audit committee? As often as necessary. At least once a year. And you, oh, you are. A, at least once a year. It's a control, internal audit, a control which functions by examining the and evaluating the adequacy and effectiveness of other controls. It is a control. Internal audit itself is an internal control. And there is a definition of internal control. It says that internal control is not only internal check and internal audit, but the whole system of controls, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so internal audit is itself an internal control, but this is an internal control which checks other internal controls. And that's what they do. It's in a large organization. It would typically be a separate department. In a smaller company, it could be that an individual, just a, a single person, is allocated tasks of an internal audit nature. It could be outsourced, and the big four accountancy firms, possibly, probably, even, even sounds awful. For me to say even sounds like you're some part of the third world uneducated area. Um, the big four will probably have internal audit functions, internal audit departments who will carry out internal audit functions for their bigger clients. If it's an in-house department, it's important that the function is structured in an appropriate way. And then we're looking at the scope. Management will prescribe it. The internal audit, you see, is responsible to management. It's established by management, and they will report to management. The particular level of management to whom they report depends on the structure of the company. Typically, we know, or ideally, we know that they should report to the audit committee. But it will be management that determines the scope, in theory. In practice, I would imagine it's the, the chief internal auditor that establishes where we should be looking, or where they should be looking, and the scope, the depth, the areas on which they should be concentrating. The scope and the objectives of the internal audit department typically will include reviewing accounting and internal control systems, detailed testing of transactions and balances, the same sort of stuff to begin with that the external auditors will do. Review the economy, efficiency and effectiveness of the operations. That's not particularly an external audit function. But clearly it is for the internal auditors. Um, it's part of their value for money um, role. Review the implementation of the entities' policies and special investigations and in addition, maybe those of you who are external auditors, maybe it could come as a surprise to realise that the internal auditors do as part of their function, uh, could possibly assist the external auditor in the pursuit of their audit inquiries. I don't know whether any of you external auditors, have you ever come across any assistance from the internal audit departments? Um, ILSA? You have? Yeah, oh, okay. The company has one. Mm? If the company has internal auditors. If, well, yes, you can't get assistance from them if the company doesn't have them, can you? 
So if the company has internal auditors, then you do actively use their uh, their services. Use information from their reports. Do you use their their reports and their inter. No. All right. Yeah, <laughs> so your internal auditors do help her, her, uh, her firm, all right. Independence of internal, for an audit function to operate successfully, for any, either audit function to operate successfully, it should have this characteristic of being independent. Uh, I said yesterday that there is no circumstance really when uh, an internal auditor should be involved in day-to-day -day transaction processing. And this independence element applies equally then to internal as well as to external auditors. For an internal audit to be effective, the reviews which they carry out must be conducted and reported on an independent basis. There should be no fear. The internal auditors should not be concerned or worried for their futures, for their jobs, for their livelihoods. Uh, in the context of if they find that they have to criticize the work or performance of a senior executive, uh, then they should be not uncomfortable. They don't have to be comfortable, but they shouldn't have any degree of fear about maybe losing their own jobs. And this is why it's ideal that they should report to the audit committee rather than report to the executive management. So to be effective, they must carry out these reviews and, and report on them on an independent basis. I was talking to um, the former student uh, down the road, and she was telling me that she was now in the internal audit department of a multinational insurance company, and that the only way she could lose her job is by board decision from the head office in Switzerland. Uh, so she was not at all frightened or worried about that having or feeling the necessity to criticize her immediate bosses because her job was secure. The equivalent to the confidence given by the... it is the equivalent to the confidence which is given by the external auditor being independent. The internal auditor, if we can guarantee or secure their independence, their objectivity, then it does mean that they, their reports are likely to be objective and likely to be more professional. The comparison between the two groups, the internals and the externals, uh, external is required by law, internal is required by necessity. Well, by necessity, really, yeah, by necessity. They're appointed by external appoints, appointed how? External. Again. Appointed by the Audit Committee. No, actually they're not appointed by the Audit Committee. The Audit Committee will find them, will identify who they want to, to approach as the auditors, but it's not the Audit Committee who appoint them. Shareholders. It's the shareholders who appoint them. In practice, who appoints them? It's in practice it will be the Executive Board, broad, or the Audit Committee preferably. Um, so they will nominate and the nomination will then be presented to the general meeting and the general meeting will probably just give the nod. I only heard of one situation where proposed replacement auditors were not appointed um, and it was many years ago, um, I think it was Price Waterhouse who were in office before the many years or so before they merged with Coopers and Wybrand uh, and there was a proposal to uh, appoint a replacement firm of auditors uh, and therefore not appoint Price Waterhouse. And the chairman had the foresight, just before the, the meeting was to start, the chairman had the foresight to um, add an additional item onto the agenda that said in the event that the replacement auditors are not appointed, then we'll have a resolution to reappoint Price Waterhouse. And in fact, the replacement auditors were not appointed. The, the shareholders rejected it and said, no, we want to keep with Price Waterhouse. So Price Waterhouse were reappointed. But it's the only situation I've ever heard where auditors have been proposed for appointment and, and not accepted and not approved. Who appoints the internals? The audit committee. 
Yeah, the audit committee will be the ones to identify the people who they want, the person particularly, the chief internal auditor, that the audit committee feel would be a sensible person to appoint. Reports to the external reports to whom? The yes, primarily to the shareholders by law, but in addition as a matter of good practice, management, management in, in order to um, recommend strengthening the system or recommend changes or identify changes in law which the company is likely to face. So they report by law to the shareholders, but they report also professionally to the management. Reporting for the internal auditors, this would be... Yeah, again, primarily to the audit committee, but then ultimately to management, to the executive. External reports on what? What's the, the basis or the format or the, or the main purpose of the external auditor's report? To report on a true and fair view, on the truth and fairness of the view shown by the financial statements. Internal will report on what? Internal controls. Yeah, on, but not just internal controls. Internal will report on whatever it is they've been doing their work on. Efficiency, effectiveness, economy, value for money, special assignments. Depends what their work is. So the report that the internal prepares is dependent upon the, um, the objective of the work that they've just carried out. Opinion, the opinion about what the, that's a continuation this next bit isn't it, the opinion is the opinion about truth and fairness. And the opinion of, for the internal I would suggest there is about the economy efficiency effectiveness. And finally on this page, finally on 62, scope. The scope of the external auditor's work is determined by whom? Careful. It's determined by, but then it's approved by, or reviewed by. It's determined by, and then it's reviewed by someone else. Yes, you're right, it's reviewed by the audit committee. Yes. But it's determined by... Themselves. By themselves, by the auditors themselves. Internal... The internal auditor's scope of work is determined by, well, I suppose, by the chief internal auditor taking into account logistics, the people he has available, she has available, the time available for them to carry out the work, the um, reaction of the audit committee when the audit committee was reviewing the internal auditor's program or suggested prospective program. So the scope is approved by um, the Audit Committee. That's page 63, Potential Threats to Independence. In the syllabus of the earlier auditing paper, paper F8, paper 2.6, paper 6 if you've been doing it for 10 years. Do you remember Threats to Independence? F, F, C, L, B, G. You just fill that list in. You just fill that list in. Family, fees, conflicts. That's um, for instance receiving commissions from one when you recommend a second to use the services of the first. Loans to or from beneficial interests that shareholdings not acceptable. And G's gifts. I had a student last year who was telling me that a big four firm 
that she'd um, been offered or the client was so happy with her that the client came into the audit room one morning and said, here, here's a jar of honey. And they wanted to give her a jar of honey. She said, no, I can't accept it. You're going to impair my objectivity. They said, never mind your objectivity here, accept the honey. And then they insisted that she keep it. So she put the jar of honey down by the side of her desk. And at the end of the audit, when she's packing all her stuff up, she went in to see the chief executive and chief financial officer and said, I'm, I'm going now, thank you very much, and we'll, you'll be hearing from us. And she's walking out from the building towards her car, and the chief executive, the chief executive came running out with his jar of honey. He said, you've forgotten your honey, you've forgotten your honey. So she then sat in the car and phoned up the office and said, they're insisting that I take a jar of honey, and I know I shouldn't accept gifts from clients. What do I do? And they said, oh, bring it back to the office and we'll have it in the office. So um, she wanted to refuse this gift of a jar of honey. Does it impair your objectivity if your client... Do you give presents to your clients? Do you give presents to your... One of the students brought in a calendar for me. If I had been an auditor, should I have I accepted that calendar? A small gift, an insignificant thing. If they give that sort of thing to, to all the people that happen to call in the office, then yes, okay, that's sort of acceptable. And pens, pens with the company name on, uh, little gifts like that. You can't reasonably claim that your objectivity is impaired if it's something of insignificant value. Have you ever been offered gifts, you auditors? Have you? And you always reject them. Yeah. You give gifts to your auditors? A calendar? A calendar? Oh, well, all right. There's one question where, I'm, I'm not sure if it's in this paper or P7, where the um, chief financial officer was so impressed with the work of the audit team that um, they would, because the audit team were working late, they would buy food for them and provide them with, sort of carry out pizzas and, um, and, and provide them with their meals in the evening. That shouldn't happen. You should not, as auditors, you shouldn't accept this type of gift. Um, but it's very difficult in practice to refuse. Uh, far from anything else, you offend the client. But offending the client is not really something which is a major concern for an audit team. That's also interesting because uh, when last year internal audit came to us, it's always like if somebody comes from head office and we invite them for dinner and then we thought either we need to invite internal audit for a dinner or not. <laughs> well, that's right. If someone does come from a head office, you take them out for dinner, but if, some, if it's an, in, an internal auditor who comes, I don't know, I would imagine you say you should say no, and he or she would say no, they don't, I don't want dinner. No, we didn't, we just told them where, where, are the where they could go and eat, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, and I presume that was the the right thing in their mind as to what should have happened. They, they weren't upset, were they? Were they upset? There were two of them. Oh, well, they keep themselves company, can't they? It should be. I think it should be the prime objective of an internal auditor to be the most hated person in the organisation. That's that's that should be. Um, yes, they didn't invite me to the Christmas party. Um, means that you're doing your job effectively. <laughs>